The 1990s was perhaps the most turbulent decade in post-independent India, one that was started with four defining events. The Gulf War in 1990-91, Rajiv Gandhi's assassination in May 1991, the demolition of the Babri Masjid in December 1992, and the Bombay serial blast in March 1993. While violence threatened the country's internal security, there was political turmoil and a great risk to the economy, forcing a series of events that forced India to chart a new course. By 1991, India had been on a boil for over a decade. Terrorism in Punjab and Kashmir, frequent communal riots on the Mandir Masjid issue, the collapse of two governments in a span of just 15 months and the hung parliament thrown up by the 1991 elections. While all this threatened the country's internal security, the economy was in deep crisis. The Gulf War in 1990-91 had sent oil prices skyrocketing. The crisis in the Middle East hit workers there and remittances fell. As a result, India's foreign exchange reserves fell so low that at the height of the crisis, India had just enough forex reserves for two weeks of imports. India stood on the brink of an economic meltdown due to this balance of payment crisis. In the 1991 general elections following the assassination of Rajiv Gandhi, the Congress was unable to secure a majority vote and it led a minority government at the centre. It was P. V. Narasimha Rao who edged out his competitors Sharad Pawar and Arjun Singh to take oath as Prime Minister on the 24th of June 1991. Rao was 70 years old when he took over the reins of the country. He had not contested the elections and had in fact declared his retirement from politics in 1991. He was packing his bags to leave Delhi for Hyderabad when fate got in the way. Rajiv's death brought him back to Delhi. Rao was a Nehruvian socialist, a leader with half a century of experience but with no political base or charisma. Yet fate had something else in store for him. Rao's leap to the top job was also a baptism by fire. It happened on the 19th of June when top finance ministry officials briefed him on the crisis the country was facing. Foreign exchange reserves were hovering at $1 billion. The fiscal deficit had ballooned to 8.4% of the GDP and external debt was $70 billion. In January, the Chandrasekhar government had negotiated two loans from the International Monetary Fund or IMF, one for $775 million and the other for $1.02 billion. The condition was that economic reforms would be introduced in the budget. But the government had failed to present the budget and could not meet its commitment due to its collapse in March. The central leadership, now reduced to a caretaker government, had to pledge 20 tons of gold with the Union Bank of Switzerland to raise $240 million by the end of May and avert the crisis. Still, default on overseas payments loomed and India's credit rating was downgraded to the speculative category. When Rao took over, he was told that the IMF was unhappy with India's failure to initiate reforms as promised by the previous government. Rao needed a finance minister who had the expertise and credibility for the job and who would be acceptable to the IMF. The mantle fell on the Oxford-educated economist and former governor of the Reserve Bank of India, Dr. Manmohan Singh. Dr. Singh lost no time rolling out structural reforms. The first step was a devaluation of the rupee. In a matter of three days, the exchange value of the rupee against the US dollar fell from 21 rupees 9 paise to 25 rupees 95 paise. Next, Commerce Minister P. Chidambaram announced a new trade policy. Reforms had been initiated but the storm had not yet passed. 
the government still needed foreign exchange to prevent a default on international payments. There was also one thing left to do. 47 tons of gold were pledged to the Bank of England to raise $400 million. Since the Bank of England insisted that the gold be deposited in their vault, three consignments were airlifted to London in utmost secrecy. But one of the vans transporting the gold from the Reserve Bank of India's vault to the airport in Mumbai broke down when it suffered a punctured tyre. This sent security officials into a tizzy, but the media got a whiff of it only after the consignment arrived at the airport. Some of the biggest changes introduced by Manmohan Singh were the dismantling of the License Control Raj, the abolition of the Monopolies and Restrictive Trade Practices Act and the relaxation in the Foreign Direct Investment Rules. It wasn't easy. Rao and Singh faced plenty of political opposition to pushing through these groundbreaking reforms. But Rao's unique consensus-building approach helped steady the minority government while the reforms rolled on. As the poet said, Sir Feroshi ki tamanna, ab hamare dil mein hai, dekhna hai, zor kitna, bazuwe, matal mein hai. Ending his historic budget speech on the 24th of July 1991, Manmohan Singh said, I do not minimize the difficulties that lie ahead on the long and arduous journey on which we have embarked. But as Victor Hugo once said, no power on earth can stop an idea whose time has come. The emergence of India as a major economic power in the world happens to be one such idea. The rest, as they say, is history. Mm -hmm.